We had some dead aliens out there. If true, the U.S. government has kept one of the greatest secrets in history, that we are not alone in the universe. It's the most important story of the millennium. If not, a footnote has become a legend. In the summer of 1947, rancher Mac Brazel came across some unusual debris in one of his fields. Brazel loaded his truck with some of the material and drove 75 miles to Roswell, New Mexico. He took it to show Sheriff George Wilcox. While he was there, Local radio reporter Frank Joyce called in to see if the sheriff had any good stories. Yeah, Sheriff Wilcox, this is Frank Joyce. How's it going? The officer passed the phone to Mac Brazell. He told the radio reporter that he might have found the remains of a flying saucer. I thought I have a real crank here, a, a guy who has picked up some information about something and he's got it all wrong, you know? This was a hoax. Myself, I don't believe it. To get rid of the likely hoaxer, Joyce told him to get in touch with the military. Welcome back, this is Frank Joyce with KGFL, Roswell, New Mexico's East. Two days later, Frank Joyce received a visitor. It was Lieutenant Walter Hote, press officer for America's only nuclear bomb squad, the 509th, stationed at Roswell. He owed me a story. I had complained to him recently about he had given a story to somebody else and I'd been left off the list. So he brings this in. I picked it up and, and as I glanced, I knew instantly it was the man on the phone. The press release stated that U.S. Army Air Corps had recovered a flying disc from a ranch north of Roswell. Frank Joyce drew only one conclusion. The US Army Air Corps says they have a flying saucer. It's gotta be from outer space. This just in, ladies and gentlemen. Joyce broadcast the extraordinary story to his local audience. It was possibly the biggest news scoop of all time. It's still the only time in the history of the United States where the government has said, we've got a flying saucer. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. The release revealed few other details. It said that a local couple had seen an unusual craft in the sky on July 2nd. A Major Jesse Marcel had recovered the debris, and it was now being taken to higher military headquarters. The incredible story was quickly picked up by Associated Press and released around the world. As soon as this story came out, all hell broke loose. New York calls, London calls, God, the world wanted to know about this. The concept of flying discs or flying saucers had caught the world's attention just two weeks earlier. On June 24th, a respected pilot, Kenneth Arnold, reported seeing nine objects flying over Mount Rainier like saucers skipping over a pond. Well, at about uh, 2.15, I took off from Bahalus, Washington, and I noticed to the left of me a chain which looked to me like the tail of a Chinese kite. They looked something like a, a pie plate that was cut in half with a sort of a convex triangle in the rear. Even though Arnold described the craft as having bat-like wings, the image of a flying saucer lodged with the public, and the term stuck. Over the next few weeks, hundreds of sightings of these new flying saucers were reported. The breaking news that one had been recovered near Roswell would at last unravel a mystery on the minds of anxious millions. What were these craft? How did they travel so fast? And were they from this planet or another? I don't believe that it was anything belonging to the United States. I don't believe it was anything belonging to Russia. 
The news of the recovery was important enough that FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover asked to be kept informed. The mystery material was flown to Fort Worth, Texas for analysis. Four hours later, a press conference was called by base commander General Roger Ramey. He told the media that contrary to earlier reports, the debris was from nothing more than a weather balloon and certainly not a flying saucer. Major Marcel, who had collected the material, posed with the mundane looking debris. The public quickly accepted the military's explanation. Most people don't realize that back 60 years ago, things were a lot different than they are today. If you were told by the government that it was a pink elephant, you would accept that. Overnight, one of the greatest headline stories became nothing but a footnote. And it may have remained a footnote forever, if it weren't for one eyewitness whose testimony would reopen the Roswell case and shock the world. So, tell me what happened back in 1947. In late 1978, a UFO researcher was introduced to retired Major Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer who'd collected debris from the original crash site. I went down and visited him when I was in Florida. Got first-hand testimony from him, sitting closer than you and I are right now. And it was very impressive. Marcel declared that there had been a cover-up. weather balloon that had crashed up there. He said that the weather balloon material shown to the press had been switched. What he'd found in Roswell in 1947 was not from this planet. This foil-like material that you could fold and fold and fold again, it would unfold on its own. Memory metal. Very thin, very lightweight. You couldn't cut it. The I-beams, the weight of balsa wood. But it wouldn't burn. This stuff wouldn't cut. Uh, it had strange symbols on it. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was a spaceship. Maybe there were aliens out there. I don't know. But I know it wasn't a weather balloon. Although the interview first came out in the National Enquirer, Jesse Marcel was certainly no crank. Here's the intelligence. Today, Roswell, New Mexico is the UFO capital of the world. Every year, thousands descend on the town to pay homage to the home of E.T. Toys and t-shirts depict the aliens believed to have landed here in 1947. A museum is dedicated to maintaining the integrity of the Roswell legend. While some come out of curiosity, most ufologists are convinced that the government has been hiding the evidence of E.T. for 60 years. A Gallup poll in 2005 showed that one in four American adults believe that extraterrestrials have visited Earth. Self-styled UFO investigators like Dennis Balthaser have been coming here for years to try to piece together the Roswell Enigma. Something happened here in 1947 that was covered up and 60 years later is still covered up. No single piece of physical evidence from the 1947 crash has ever surfaced publicly. Declassified documents haven't as yet revealed any compelling evidence. So UFO campaigners are forced to rely almost solely on individual testimony. The witnesses to me are key. Those are key ingredients to solving this. Now, getting the witnesses to talk is a different story. Since 1978, over a hundred witnesses have been persuaded to talk. Many of them, like George Newling, offer little more than glimpsed memories. What I've seen, uh, it wasn't made in this world. 17-year-old Private Newling was working on B-29s at Roswell in 1947 when he remembers catching sight of something he thinks was part of a spaceship. The first thing that caught my eye was this object that was in the bomb racks, and it was the color that fascinated me. It was a gray, but nothing I've ever seen then or before or after. Testimonies like this, made decades after the event, 
have been pieced together to tell the Roswell legend in a series of sensational books. Postman turned UFO author Don Schmidt has been following the Roswell mystery for nearly three decades. His numerous books on the subject have made him one of the key champions of the legend. Schmidt's witnesses have convinced him that the government actually recovered a flying saucer back in 1947. All of our witnesses are telling us it was the first press release. That was the correct one. They recovered the flying saucer. Thanks to these accounts, the UFO community often cite Roswell to be the best proof that extraterrestrials have been here. But they face a wall of scientific disagreement. My witness accounts are completely uh, unreliable. And we know this from a huge amount of research done in the 1990s following the false memory, recovered memory business of people recovering memories of things that happened decades before that in fact never happened. The legend begins with why aliens noticed Earth in the 1940s. What is the one specific intelligence signal that is still traveling out through our galaxy? And that's that first atomic bomb flash from June of 1945. And it still took them two years to get here. And they appeared to have arrived in mass to some degree in the summer of 47. In fact, the first signals in space were a decade earlier with the advent of radio and television. I think they were here to scope out the activity here. You want to find out about the military? You had White Sands proving ground where they were doing all the V-2 rocket launches. Los Alamos, where they were still conducting atomic research, and then here in Roswell, where you had the first atomic bomb squad to the 509th bomb group. Other Roswell campaigners think the aliens had come here to save us. Maybe they came to help. Roswell is less than 100 miles from where the atomic bomb was set off two years before the incident happened. Were they sitting out there wondering what are these clowns up to? Are they going to self-destruct? Don Schmidt has interviewed military witnesses who recalled monitoring UFOs in New Mexico in June 1947. We had talked to one of the radar operators up at Kirtland Army Airfield up in Albuquerque at that time and admitted to us that they had tracked a number of unknowns throughout the state, a number of days leading up to the actual incident. It would only make sense that for all of the sightings at that time, that one would eventually crash. On Independence Day 1947, legend has it that the rancher who found the debris, Mac Brazel, recalled a violent electrical storm. Between the thunderclaps, Brazel told friends he might have heard some kind of explosion. The Roswell story tells that one of the alien spaceships was struck by lightning, causing major damage. Debris from the stricken spaceship fell onto Mac Brazel's field before crashing into the ground 35 miles away. So uh, when did you say you found it? I just I drove out and it was all over the place like this. Once the story reached the Roswell Army Airfield, two intelligence officers were dispatched to evaluate and collect the debris. Major Jesse Marcel and plainclothes officer Captain Sheridan Cavett filled several sacks with the material. That night, Major Marcel took some of the debris home and showed it to his 11-year-old son, Jesse Jr. And when I walked in, I thought, well, why are you waking me up just to look at some garbage here? And he says, no, I look at this carefully because this is not anything you'll ever see again. And he says, I think this is parts of what they call flying saucers. In the meantime, they've also learned that there's another site much closer to town, also based on civilian testimony. A now dead witness, Jim Ragsdale, professed to have been with his girlfriend when he saw the spaceship crash 50 miles northwest of Roswell. In an affidavit, the local Romeo told how the military quickly arrived and removed both the crashed alien spaceship and its dead crew. North of town, they are loading onto a flatbed 
and loading into ambulance trucks the remains of a ship and crew. According to Ragsdale's testimony, four extraterrestrial bodies were found in the wreckage. The aliens were said to be small, with large heads and huge eyes. We have talked to witnesses who are first-hand witnesses, second, third, fourth-hand witnesses. Their stories pretty well collaborate the description of the bodies that were found. Oh, it's, it's probably this. Radio reporter Frank Joyce remembers that Mac Brazell told him there were alien bodies at the first debris site. The key question I asked him was, look, were there any passengers? He said, yes, there were little people. They were not human, and they were dead. In other words, he had some dead aliens out there. If any of these reports were accurate, a crashed alien craft and its dead crew were now in the hands of the U.S. military. Several witnesses claimed the military then took the debris and bodies to Hangar 84 at Roswell's Army Airfield. We've heard of uh, military surrounding the hangar, the debris and, and uh, bodies inside the hangar, guarded, uh, military outside with weapons. I have interviewed a witness who claims to have seen a body in the hangar where the debris was taken prior to being shipped to Wright Field up in Ohio. Wright-Patterson Airfield in Ohio is a top-secret military base for examining enemy aircraft. Only second-hand testimony exists of alien materials being flown there, but it has become an accepted part of the Roswell legend. Back in Roswell, eyewitnesses like Jim Ragsdale testified that there was a huge recovery operation 50 to 60 troops are up at the debris field on hands and knees, shoulder to shoulder, picking up every last shard of that wreck. Yeah, that's good. The Roswell defenders also claim that as part of the cover-up, the military ransacked media offices. We have numerous accounts from the radio stations as well as the newspapers describing how military MPs went from office to office, confiscating, ransacking desks and file cabinets. UFO promoters report that a number of witnesses, like rancher Mac Brazell, were threatened to keep the story quiet. And when he's finally allowed to return home, he's sworn to secrecy. He was, by all accounts, a broken man. It's quite clear that the government resorted to very extreme measures in, in keeping this quiet. Okay, move it, move it. The Roswell legend only came to life in the late 1970s, 30 years after the fact. But strangely, it follows almost the exact same storyline as a 1950s UFO hoax. Coincidence or not? In 1938, Orson Welles dramatized The War of the Worlds for a nationwide radio audience. Welles' performance was so convincing that thousands ran terrified into the streets, believing they were already under attack from robotic Martians. The War of the Worlds phenomenon is no different in principle than any mass hysteria. This is how they work. Uh, you know, an idea gets planted, it gets started in some form of uh, medium communication, people hear it, and then they start talking about it, then the panic builds. Ever since Wells' broadcast, the threat of alien visitors from outer space has been part of popular culture. But in 1945, a much greater threat came from the skies. The fear of a nuclear war was suddenly very real. The Cold War was upon us. We were deathly afraid of the Russians and hydrogen bombs and attacks of all sorts. Then to add to public fear, in June 1947, there were hundreds of sightings of unidentified flying objects. What were they, and who did they belong to? When the story of a recovered flying disc in Roswell hit the world, it seemed at last the mystery of flying saucers would be solved. But almost immediately, the story disappeared. America continued to search for answers elsewhere. Were these flying saucers Russian spy planes? Or were they our own? 
or were they literally from another world? Hundreds of UFO movies, books, and comics played to the public's fascination. Here we had flying saucers, aliens in spaceship playing on television and movies, and while they were frightening, they were entertainment that took us away from the real fear, which was the Russians. Then in 1950, a non-fiction book offered proof that aliens were visiting us. Behind the Flying Saucers, written by Hollywood columnist Frank Scully, was a sensational account of a crashed UFO. Frank Scully was a well-regarded author, and he wrote a book uh, essentially about what two men had told him about this incident in Aztec, New Mexico. Scully's two informants had revealed that, like Roswell, a crashed flying saucer and dead aliens were recovered in New Mexico in 1947. There was some kind of a crash out on the highway. Bodies were retrieved and taken to a, a military base in northern New Mexico. The story parallels Roswell in many ways. The alien craft was made from some kind of lightweight but indestructible metal. There was a type of hieroglyphic writing. The alien bodies are said to have been three and a half feet tall with skinny human-like bodies. And like Roswell, the extraterrestrial evidence was hidden at a secret military base. But strangely, the book had nothing to do with Roswell. Frank Scully's 1950 publication is set in Aztec, New Mexico, nearly 400 miles from Roswell. The Roswell story, which shadows so much of the Aztec book, would not be told for another 30 years. Behind the Flying Saucers was a bestseller, and most believed it to be true. Then, in 1952, the two informers of the book, Silas Newton and Leo Gebauer, were convicted of fraud. Their Aztec story was a complete hoax. But reports of the scam had little impact on the public. By then, the idea of extraterrestrial visitors in Flying Saucers had already captured the public's imagination. The whole business of a flying saucer is classic myth-making from a single source saying they were skipping along like saucers on water. And from there, all science fiction authors, uh, movie makers, they all say, okay, we have to construct a model that looks like, you know, a, a saucer. In other words, science fiction was becoming science fact. Many of these 1950s sci-fi movies were set in the deserts of New Mexico, a hotbed of top-secret projects, from nuclear bombs to V-2 rockets to experimental crafts and other deadly weapons. All these projects were shrouded in secrecy and intense security. When a V-2 rocket crashed in Alamogordo, New Mexico, it created a massive military operation. We had a batch of GIs, basically shoulder to shoulder, marching down this valley where the crash occurred. Naturally, some people had picked up a few pieces of metal and said, I've got me a souvenir. Uh, the army went door to door, so they recovered all the wreckage. Such covert action eventually created suspicion among the public. Science fiction started to paint the military as the bad guys. Then in the 1960s came the Vietnam War. It was the first war the Americans weren't likely to win. The huge loss of life and clandestine operations changed Americans' image of their government. Richard Nixon's deceptions and scandals added to the nation's growing distrust. What else was the government covering up? Anything seemed possible, even extraterrestrials. Against this backdrop of mistrust, conspiracy rumors grew that the military was hiding alien technology at secret military bases. 
Secret places like the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and especially Area 51 are like Rorschach ink blots on our imaginations to just see what it is we want to see that's in there because you're not going to get in there. How can we check and find out? So that allows the imagination to just run amok. UFO advocates fervently believe that the government is hiding an alien craft and its dead crew. Something did crash. Something was recovered. Whatever was recovered, the government still has it in its possession. Sensational books and films have made bold claims of an incredible military cover-up. But demands on the government to make public any secrets on extraterrestrials have failed to uncover any relevant information. SETI is an independent scientific body searching space for any signal of extraterrestrial intelligence. The facts are that we haven't found the signal from space that would tell us that there's somebody out there. Is it possible that E.T. could have known about Earth in the 1940s? Shostak thinks the theory of aliens noticing atomic blasts in 1945 is implausible. Well, that means they can't be more than one light year away, right? Because it would take a year for the signal, the light from those explosions to get to them, and they have to come back down here. They can't go faster than the speed of light. So one year out, one year back, that's two light years to get back here by 1947. There are no stars within one light year of the sun. Whatever the truth about Roswell, the fact remains that from June 1947 onwards, there were UFO sightings all over America. One year later, the Pentagon responded with an investigation to gather military and civilian testimony. It became known as Project Blue Book. In June that year, just 12 months after the supposed Roswell incident, a Project Blue Book advisory committee met in secret to discuss their findings. Colonel Howard McCoy, chief of intelligence for the Army, confirmed at the secret meeting that the military had never recovered a flying saucer. He then went on to make a statement that is devastating to the Roswell case. McCoy said, and I quote, I can't even tell you how much we would give to have one of those crash in an area so that we could recover whatever they are. If the alien story of Roswell were true, such a recovery would certainly have generated a huge military paper trail. But no compelling documentary evidence has ever emerged which supports the UFO claims. Their only proof comes from witness accounts. This long list of witnesses is very curious because they didn't come out of the closet, so to speak, until the 1980s when Roswell became the Roswell incident, the mecca of ufology. And that tells us more about modern myth-making than it does about eyewitness accounts. In 1989, claims that dead aliens were at the crash site created quite a stir. But these claims only surfaced 40 years after the event. The first to mention extraterrestrial bodies was retired mortician Glenn Dennis. Glenn Dennis was a mortician at uh, Ballard Funeral Home. He claims that uh, he knew a nurse out at the base at the infirmary that uh, was involved with uh, taking notes while they were doing an examination on a body. And she had drawn a, a a sketch of an alien face and hand, and given it to Glenn. Neither the nurse nor the original drawing has ever been found, causing suspicion of the claim. Dennis redrew what he asserts the mystery nurse had shown him. Seth Shostak wonders why the aliens look so humanoid. It's unlikely that the aliens will look like us, but it's very uh, handy if you're making a, a film or a TV series about aliens that they look something like us, because otherwise, how are you going to relate to them as, as a member of the audience? Frank Joyce recalls that rancher Mac Brazel told him that there were also alien bodies up at the debris site. I remember on the phone he told me he had some dead aliens out there. But Major Jesse Marcel, who was keen to prove the debris was alien, never mentioned any bodies. My dad never saw them, or if he did, he never mentioned it to me, but I think had he seen them, he would have certainly made it be known that, yeah, there were some people out there too. Even the UFO community has mixed feelings about the allegations of alien bodies. The uh, part about the Roswell incident involving bodies 
uh, is extremely questionable, primarily because nothing was mentioned about them for, for many years. And uh, the number of bodies varies depending who you talk to. Dennis Balthaser acknowledges the Roswell story is littered with unreliable witnesses. Some witnesses have decided to elaborate on their stories. Some have outright lied. Some weren't involved at all, but have given the impression that they were. The false testimony and many hoaxes in the Roswell legend are reminiscent of the 1950 novel Behind the Flying Saucers. The only concrete part of the Roswell legend is that some kind of debris was found in Mac Brazell's field in 1947. When Jesse Jr. saw the debris as an 11-year-old boy, his father was already convinced it was extraterrestrial. He just said something like he thought this was parts of a flying saucer. Again, I wasn't quite sure what he meant by that. Jesse Marcel is the only person alive today who has consistently claimed to have handled the material. His testimony is key to proving the Roswell incident was extraterrestrial. But Dr. Michael Shermer argues that a young boy would be strongly influenced by his father's opinion. An 11-year-old boy is going to be hugely influenced by his father under any conditions. But in this case, his father is a well-respected military officer. Of course, uh, he's going to be influenced. Even though he's an important witness, much of what Marcel describes sounds commonplace. There's a lot of metal foil, uh, kind of a thick uh, aluminum wrap type of uh, material. And there was some black plastic material that look, uh, looked like Bakelite at that time. Legend has it that the metal foil had extraordinary qualities, but the young boy saw none. I know that the, the foil was supposed to have been like metal with a mirror where if you bend it, fold it, it would unfold. Well, I didn't see that. Other key witnesses, including Mac Brazell, suggest the debris was quite ordinary. UFO advocates have refused to accept any of these statements, saying that the witnesses were either lying to maintain the cover-up or simply confused. In 1978, Jesse Marcel Sr. claimed the material he had collected on Mac Brazell's ranch had been switched with the debris from a weather balloon. Major Marcel said until the day he died that what was on the floor was not what he brought in from Roswell, New Mexico. To ufologists, that explains why the debris in press photos looked like a weather balloon, not a flying saucer. But amazing new testimony from Marcel's own son suggests the Major thought the debris reporter saw actually was part of an alien spaceship. There's one curious element, though. My, my dad said that the reporter saw only a very small part of the real thing. So does that mean that in that mix-up of a balloon wreckage, was there parts of the real stuff in there? Today, Jesse Marcel admits that it's possible that the foil-like material in the photographs and what his father had brought home could be the same. Well, you know, the foil had, did not have the paper backing. Could have been confused with the foil that I saw. Jesse Marcel remains convinced that there was one thing in the debris that could only be extraterrestrial. He describes small metal-like I-beams with hieroglyphic symbols. The metal beam, like a small miniaturized eye beam, and it had these uh, purplish violet symbols uh, on the inside edge of that. You know, my dad says something like, this is alien writing. While Marcel Jr. describes metal eye beams, his father remembered them as not being like metal. It looked more like wood. Such contradictions among eyewitnesses are widespread among the Roswell faithful. Other key witnesses also described very earthly debris of wooden sticks, tinfoil, a tough paper, and rubber strips. Scientists and skeptics alike find it hard to believe an alien spaceship would be constructed from such simple materials. If you're going to go from one star system to another, you need a craft that can go a fair fraction of the speed of light. It has to go tens, maybe 100,000 miles a second. 
Well, a craft like that is going to have to have enormous engines. It's going to be something that's going to, you know, probably be the size of an ocean liner. This is not going to be a little, you know, souped up motorbike. While the physical abilities of this material remains in question, almost all the key witnesses made reference to seeing unusual markings. Jesse Marcel described seeing alien hieroglyphs on small metal I-beams. I have to believe this was something from another civilization. I'm absolutely convinced of that. The Marcells both think they saw alien hieroglyphics. But other witnesses testified to seeing nothing more than flowered patterns. If the origin of these markings can be identified, it might solve the Roswell mystery once and for all. It's about time people knew that something strange went on out there that night. In 1978, when Jesse Marcel recalled events from 30 years earlier, he unwittingly kick-started the Roswell legend. Ever since, UFO authors have expanded the story to mythic proportions. But the Roswell legend makers can't agree on many key details. Where the spaceship crashed, who actually saw it, and how many bodies were recovered changes from book to book. But the Army's counter story, that the debris was from a weather balloon, was also in question. Back in 1947, rancher Mac Brazell had reported that he'd seen weather balloon debris before, and what he'd found was different. Throughout the 1980s, suspicion of a cover-up fueled the Roswell legend. Then in the early 90s, two UFO researchers, Carl Flock and Robert Todd, unearthed a top-secret mission that had long been forgotten. It offered a much simpler and earthly solution to the Roswell mystery. Back in 1945, America exploded the first atomic bomb. It was then only a matter of time until the Soviets would develop their own nuclear program. In 1947, testing began on an American secret spying program called Project Mogul. The highly classified mission was set up to listen out for any Soviet atomic test. Mogul was so classified, we didn't know what the classification was. In fact, Mogul was classified as 1A, the same as the H-bomb program. Project Mogul would use some 50 large rubber balloons to carry listening devices called transponders into the higher atmosphere. Up here, sound moved much quicker, and a nuclear explosion could, in theory, be detected, even on the other side of the world. I know it worked because I saw a beautiful signal come in one day from the Pacific, and it was an American nuclear bomb explosion, and I was tracking it right here in New Mexico. In 1947, B.D. Gildenberg was a young engineering undergraduate at New York University when the military commissioned his department to work on Project Mogul. The Mogul team started to gather the materials needed for the project. One item that they farmed out to a Brooklyn toy manufacturer was the kite-like radar reflectors, called Raywind targets. These would be used in order to track the balloon's movements, and the team needed hundreds of them. They were essentially six-pronged kites with a balsa wood frame, covered with silver foil, and backed with strong white material. In June 1947, the NYU team traveled with all their equipment to White Sands Testing Range in New Mexico. From this remote desert location, they began experimental launches of their new top-secret mission. This was the first time that constant-level balloons were used in the United States, which we were still learning about and still experimenting with. On the 4th of June, test flight number four was launched in mid-afternoon. But due to cloud cover, the Mogul team soon lost it on both radar and spotter plane. As it drifted northeast towards Roswell, 
The free trailing device was some 600 feet long, twice the height of the Statue of Liberty. With up to 50 large balloons, nine shiny Raywin targets, ballast controls, and transponders, it would have looked very different from a weather balloon. Eventually, the neoprene rubber balloons disintegrated, showering the desert below. Although the mission was top secret, the equipment itself was of little value, and the Mogul team deemed its recovery low priority. Brazel's description of the debris being of rubber, silver foil, and balsa wood, and that there was lots of it, matches Project Mogul perfectly. The photographs of the debris clearly show similar items. But Jesse Marcel Jr. still believes that the hieroglyphs he'd seen 60 years ago were not from this earth. The high beams were, were apart from everything. This was something from another civilization. He had a point. There seemed to be no reason why Project Mogul would have strange hieroglyphic symbols on any part of it. But closer inspection of the design drawings for the radar reflectors offers a vital clue. The paper-backed foil needed to be secured to the balsa frame with both glue and scotch tape. The toy company in Brooklyn, commissioned to make the Raywin targets, used what it had at hand. That included kids scotch tape with flowered patterns set in a purple dye. After a few days in the desert sun, the scotch tape would have peeled off and blown into the desert. In such heat, the purple dye had impregnated the wood, leaving behind flowered patterns on the balsa wood frame. Some of the tape had these inscriptions from the Brooklyn Toy Department on it. And that's where the hieroglyphics came from. And it was really <laughs> nothing very exotic. Today, science sees Roswell as little more than myth-making. We have a really good understanding now of the psychology and um, the sociology of myth-making. How an idea gets started, it's based on some, some factual event, sure, but then it just starts to build and the story gets retold and memories are not reliable, they're filtered, and before you know it, things get completely different. Today, Project Mogul is accepted among most scientists as the rational answer to the Roswell mystery. New testimony suggests that Project Mogul and its successors may have also been responsible for the entire UFO phenomenon. From June 1947 onwards, hundreds of top-secret high-altitude balloons were launched all over America. The balloons and payloads were ever more bizarre. B.D. Gildenberg believes that these balloons were what many people were mistaking for alien crafts. I remember the CIA being at some of our launches and they were the ones who were pushing this. Said, yeah, let these remain UFO reports as a cover-up for all these secret programs that were coming on board. If Roswell is nothing more than a myth, why have a quarter of American adults been taken in by it? We do tend to believe things that are kind of titillating, exciting. The idea that there's beings around, maybe they're even here now just in orbit with stealth technology and they're watching us, they're taking care of us. All that is uh, very compelling. But when we actually go and check and it turns out not to be true, then it's time to you know, move on to something else. What we now know about Roswell is that Mac Brazell did discover debris in his field and just as he reported, it wasn't a weather balloon. The government did cover up the truth. Project Mogul was a Category 1A top secret spy mission crucial to national security. It did cause a moment of excitement because no one outside of Project Mogul had seen that configuration of a balloon device before. The local army probably did overreact as they had no idea how sensitive the project or the material was. Wright-Patterson Airfield still remains a top secret military base responsible for examining strange craft but of foreign planes, not of E.T. 
UFO spokespeople have already dismissed Project Mogul as bogus, just another government smokescreen. They remain convinced that somewhere under lock and key is a secret X-file that outlines an incredible story. That alien spaceships traveled through the galaxy to save humanity, only to crash in the desert outside Roswell. They refuse to accept that Mac Brazell stumbled across nothing more than the disintegrating debris of a top secret military project, partially stuck together by scotch tape. Perhaps the real Roswell conspiracy is that so many have been taken in for so long by nothing but a footnote in history. Whenever the skeptics, you know, challenge us, well, why is it you don't have any whistleblowers regarding the topic of UFOs, or more specifically Roswell? Well, we've had whistleblowers, you know, since 1947. The problem is nobody listens. When you have objects described in formerly classified government memos as being disc-shaped, as invading sensitive airspace, and when you can see from the tone of the memos that this is a very serious matter, then clearly, there's something important happening. There are two photographs, two slides, where you can see the bodies. This issue had been proven 50 years ago. This is a political problem. It's a political policy. You can't solve it with science. You have to solve it with political engagement. We have a, a significant proof for the Roswell event as an extraterrestrial event. What the world is going to do with it is up to the world. If humanity really understands the importance of this, that this phenomenon is real, then the mission has been accomplished. There's no other conclusion for me to draw than the conclusion that I must be going in the right direction. I must be getting close to something that they don't like. To a small but dedicated group of UFO researchers, this barren ranch land, 75 miles northwest of Roswell, New Mexico, is sacred territory. It's the place where they believe one or more alien spaceships crashed to Earth sometime in early July 1947. I think there was probably a mid-air collision that resulted in one going one way and exploding and dumping all the wreckage out in the debris field, the other making it down almost intact. Today, that crash, commonly referred to as the Roswell incident, is the stuff of legend. But we might never have heard of Roswell if not for a former nuclear physicist turned UFO researcher named Stan Friedman. After spending nearly 30 years investigating the incident, hunting down dozens of key witnesses and scores of top secret documents, Friedman is convinced that the U.S. government is covering up a UFO crash. This is his proof. It begins in 1978, when after giving a lecture on UFOs, someone casually asks if he's ever met former military intelligence officer Jesse Marcel. Brilliant investigator that I am, I said, who's he? I never heard of him. Oh, well, he handled pieces of the wreckage in one of those saucers you're interested in. What? Friedman tracks down Marcel in Louisiana and first hears the fantastic tale about the day Marcel helped recover a real alien spaceship. There were just fragments strewn all over the area, an area about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. So, uh, Jesse tells me a story was in newspapers 
all around the world, but he doesn't remember the exact date. And he tells me how they took the wreckage to Fort Worth, Texas, and he was told not to say anything. Friedman checks with the local Roswell paper, and sure enough, there it is. July 8, 1947, Roswell Army Air Force captures flying saucer. It was a big sensational thing. Front page headlines, not just the Roswell Daily Record, which is kind of a small paper, but in the West Coast papers, Los Angeles Herald Express, huge paper, and so forth. But there's a follow-up story, too. One day later, a report from the U.S. military that the wreckage isn't a crashed UFO after all. It's pieces of a downed weather balloon. But now, 30 years later, here's Marcel telling Friedman the balloon story is false, part of a cover-up by the U.S. government. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all air activities, that it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else, which we didn't know what it was. In the weeks leading up to the Roswell incident, the country is gripped by UFO fever after a commercial pilot reports seeing nine strange objects flying over Washington state. He said that they acted like saucers bobbing or skipping across the water. It was from him that the term flying saucer came from. Hundreds of flying saucer sightings pour in, especially in New Mexico, home to top secret test sites for V-2 rockets and atomic and nuclear weapons. The city of Roswell itself is the base of the 509th, the world's only atomic air squadron. Just two years earlier, it had dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If aliens were gonna be interested in anything that happened on this planet, boy, they'd make a beeline for New Mexico. As the story goes, on that fateful night in early July, 1947, a violent thunderstorm rolls through Roswell. Out in the desert, rancher Mac Brassel sleeps fitfully in his tiny cabin. There had been a big electric storm, and he heard what he thought was an explosion that didn't sound like thunder. The next morning, Brazel checks on his animals and notices they won't cross a pasture. He goes for a closer look and stumbles across debris littered over a large field. And he finds this huge amount of stuff, strange material, covering an area hundreds of feet wide by almost three quarters of a mile long. The material is odd, lightweight, but incredibly strong. Brazel carries a few pieces to his neighbor's ranch. Kind of a tan, light brown plastic. Brazel mentions other debris, items covered with strange writing. He said the writing wasn't like Japanese writing, but it was, I imagine, more like ear or something like that. The strangest material looks like aluminum foil, but with a weird ability to return to its original shape. If you picked it up and folded it, it would unfold. And if you folded it several times, it would still unfold. And you couldn't tear it. Brazel drags some of the debris to a shed. A few days later, he's on the phone with Frank Joyce, a local DJ and radio reporter. He began to talk about things that, that might be out of this world. I thought maybe this is a, a hoax. During the conversation, Joyce says Brazel mentions finding bodies in the wreckage. And one thing that he mentioned on the phone was the horrible odor that was with these bodies. Thinking Brazel might be insane, Joyce tries to end the call. I advised him to go to the U.S. Army Air Corps because they are flyers and will know what to do about anything that flies. Brazel does call Roswell Army Airfield. Major Jesse Marcel answers the phone. Marcel reports the call to his commanding officer, who orders him and a counterintelligence officer to go investigate. He says, go out with him because the rancher said there's a whole mess of this stuff out there and nothing that he brought in was conventional. At the ranch, Marcel is also puzzled by the debris. He gathers it up and heads back to Roswell. He's so excited by the potential discovery, he stops by his home after midnight and wakes his wife and 11-year-old son, Jesse Jr. He said something like, uh, this is parts of what we feel is a flying saucer. 
Jesse Marcel Jr. is a doctor and colonel in the U.S. Army Reserves. He just got back from Iraq. He's writing a manuscript called Roswell, It Really Happened. Even though it happened many years ago, he still vividly remembers what his father showed him that night. I picked up the material and it was, I noticed it had a very strange quality to it. It was very light. I didn't try to bend it or tear it, uh, but I just kind of looked at it and just kind of wondered what this was. Marcel's father continues on to the base to report his findings to his superiors. The next morning, the base commander orders the public information officer to write a press release about the incident. He gave me exactly what he wanted in the press release, that we had in our possession a flying disc. The story hits the airwaves, creating an instant sensation. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. But almost as quickly begins what appears to be a government cover-up. From the time that story came out, I felt that someone somewhere was trying to stop every last word of this story. 